I'm not supposed to be here. Statistically, I'm a miracle. Did you know that an estimated 60% of teen girls' first pregnancies are preceded by experiences of molestation, rape, or attempted rape? And statistically, three out of every 10 American teen girls will get pregnant once by the time she turns 20. Generally, these girls end up having to forfeit college. Many times, they get stuck in society. I was one of those girls. That was supposed to be the story I lived. But I'm not here today to talk about the miracle of me changing my story. In fact, this isn't about miracles at all. In 2014, Boston University conducted a study looking at the development of children's pre-life reasoning. The purpose of the study was to see if culture causes beliefs to appear or if they appear spontaneously. The researchers looked at two groups of kids from Ecuador. The first group was from the Shar village. These kids were hunters and farmers. They had no pre-life beliefs. They compared these kids to a more urban area, Quito, Ecuador. These kids have grown up or growing up in a place that is a very strong Roman Catholic culture. The pre-life belief is that life begins at conception. The researchers showed these kids some pictures. They showed them a picture of a baby, of a young woman, and of a pregnant woman. Then they asked them some questions about their abilities during each of these times, as a baby, in the womb, and before conception. Now, interestingly enough, the researchers found that both groups of kids had remarkably similar responses despite their radical differences in culture. Both groups of kids, remember, these kids are between the ages of 5 and 12, they believed that their bodies did not exist before they could think or remember. However, they did believe that their emotions and desires existed before they were born. Between the ages of 5 and 12, these kids understood that their bodies didn't exist, but they couldn't imagine that their emotions and desires weren't there. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to call your emotions and desires your spirit. And what I call your spirit is a powerful life force that's in us that we can't imagine ourselves in the world without it. And in my experience, that life force, that spirit, is innately positive. It is by its nature positive. It wants nothing but good for us. It's the ultimate pursuit of joy. So here we have these kids between the ages of 5 and 12. They recognize this truth. But then what happens to us as we reach 30 and 40 and 50 and beyond? What happens to that pursuit of ultimate joy? It seems like we start out at one place and we move to another and we experience life, and it seems like it would take a miracle to get back to that place of joy. Let me tell you a story about a woman named Linda. I sat across from Linda. We had met a couple times before. She was very successful, the ultimate professional, and she was miserable. She couldn't imagine her life without her work. We had met a few times, and I said to her, I said, Linda, who would you be without your work? What would you be without the success of your career? And it must have been the right question at the right time, because she began to cry. Now, it doesn't stop there. I continued to ask that same question over and over again for a period of several months. Today, that woman who was deathly afraid, terrified 
of being without work, is currently unemployed and full of joy. You see, it takes asking the right question over and over again. But it's not always that question. Take Chris, for example. Chris calls herself an introvert. Again, very successful, highly educated. She's a nurse. At the end of every day, she goes home, locks herself inside, and she has very little social connections. She's 40-some years old. Her life force had been dented for 40-some years. It just took a couple times of asking the question to Chris, and I said, Chris, who would you be if you weren't an introvert? We began to see a shift. Chris is now running for school board. I talked with her a couple days ago, and she said to me that she would have never been able to take the risk of running for school board because she thought she was too scared of dealing with the confrontation that she believed existed in that environment. But there she is, Chris the introvert, running for school board and pursuing joy. You see, it's not about miracles. It doesn't take a miracle. It takes asking the right hard-nosed question over and over again. There I was, 16 and pregnant. I had the weight of the world on my shoulders and I felt like a complete disappointment. I could have stayed in my shame and done nothing, but instead I asked myself the question, who do I want to be for this baby? You see, the question will ring hollow if it's not attached to the person inside of it. The question only works when you allow it to be attached to the spirit of the person inside of it. You ask the question over and over again, not just once or twice, consistently going back to the question. You keep going back to the question. But it worked. It worked for me, it worked for Linda, it worked for Chris, and it worked for many others. At 16, I began asking that question. I felt scared and alone. Today, I have two grown children. I've been married for 20 years, hold a corporate job, and run a successful business. And I still ask the question. But instead of saying, who do I want to be for my kids, or my husband, or the world, I finally learned to ask the question for myself. Who do I want to be for me? Which is what my spirit wanted to begin with. The thing that's got me to this point, through all of the dysfunction and craziness and the place that I grew up, was my mother would say this one thing to me when I would tell her how bad I felt. And she would say, Heather, God doesn't make junk. You see, the spirit force, that life force, wherever it comes from, isn't junk. What we put in front of it, what we try to hide from it, that's the junk. Don't pray for a miracle. Ask yourself the question, who would I be if I wasn't a what? And answer it for yourself. Thank you.